Good morning, folks. Uh, welcome to BCCIE's virtual forum, The Impacts of COVID-19 and Next Steps for the Public Post-Secondary System. My name is Randall Martin, Executive Director of the British Columbia Council for International Education, and I will be your moderator today. Thank you for joining us in what I trust will be an insightful discussion on pertinent and pressing topics facing BC's post-secondary institutions as we navigate the COVID-19 crisis and focus on taking stock, moving forward, and recovery in the coming months. Today's event evolved from a recent survey BCCIE conducted with stakeholders in the international education sector, undertaken to better understand how the pandemic has impacted planning and operations as they relate to international students. I hope today further contextualizes our findings. Before we get started, it's important to acknowledge that at BCCIE, we live and work on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Now, on to a few housekeeping items. Attendees will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to submit a question to our panelists during the broadcast, please type them into the question box in the control panel. We'll try to get those at the end of the discussion. And if you require any technical assistance during the webinar, please also use the question box and our communications team will answer your inquiry. We are very fortunate today to host three public post-secondary presidents representing respectively the colleges, the institutes and teaching universities, and the research universities. These leaders have been historically and deeply involved in international education in their own institutions and at others, in their post-secondary communities, with their international and domestic partners, their boards and stakeholders, and in the interface between government, national, and provincial associations. They bring a unique, and big picture perspective to the discussion today. I would like to welcome our panelists and ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves and their institutions. Maybe we can start with you, AJ. Great. Uh, good morning, Randall. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for having me, and I'm happy to join uh, Philip and Michelle on this. Uh, first of all, I hope all of you are keeping well, including uh, those that are attending the webinar. Uh, thank you for taking the time to do that. Um, so I am uh, the president and CEO of Vancouver Community College. Uh, I've been in the post-secondary sector for about 17 years, uh, working from faculty to administration and to senior administration. Half of that time has been uh, spent uh, with the international file at uh, Langara College and then more recently at BCC. Um, have had a lot of experience around growing international uh, with the teams that we've had at each of the institutions. I also sit on the Colleges Institute Canada International Advisory Committee, uh, as well as the Board of Directors for CBIE. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Michelle? Uh, thank you, Randall. Uh, congratulations, AJ. Uh, my name is Michelle Turco, and I'm the President and CEO of the Justice Institute of British Columbia. Um, I'm uh, currently uh, just hitting my 34th year in higher education, and that's been uh, split between the college sector at Douglas College and the last 10 years here at JBC. I have the honor and privilege of serving on the BCCIE Board of Directors, and I'm also chair of the College and Institutes Canada Board of Directors as well. I look forward to our conversation today. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. And Philip? Yeah. Well, thanks, Randall, and thank you so much for the invitation to join this uh, panel today. And welcome to everybody who's uh, tuning in in this uh, new format we've all becoming uh, used to. My name is uh, Philip Steenkamp. I'm the president and vice chancellor of Royal Roads University. I've been there just about 14 months, and prior to that, I was vice president at UBC and at SFU General <laughs> Relations. And then I had a 17-year uh, career in government as deputy minister in various portfolios, including advanced education in BC and Ontario. And currently, I sit on the International Committee of uh, Universities Canada as well, and very much look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, we heard Michelle offer congratulations to AJ. Uh, AJ has just in the last week or so become the permanent new uh, president at BCC. The interim is gone, so congratulations also, AJ, well deserved. Congratulations. So thank you everyone. I would like to begin by offering some context to the sector. Uh, international education is an important part of BC's education ecosystem in terms of de diversifying our classrooms and communities, offering intercultural experience, opportunity and growth to our own students, 
and inviting students from around the world into our classrooms and communities. It is at one both a social good and an important economic generator for our districts and institutions and communities. Canada and BC have been enjoying rapid and some might say unsustainable growth for over a decade, while many other competitor countries stubbed their toes or fell briefly out of favour with key markets. We are one of the most desirable destinations in the world and BC one of the most desirable destinations within Canada. Per capita, BC has the most international students in the country. We are notoriously lax in Canada at keeping up to date and relevant statistics, although the best information we have is that in, the, in December of 2019, we had over 640,000 international students in Canada, a 160% increase over 10 years, contributing over $20 billion to the Canadian economy and schools. In BC, we have over 160,000 international students, over 65,000 or 40% of them in public post-secondary institutions. There are over 30,000 jobs in BC directly tied to international education, supported primarily from the revenue stream from international students, and international education brings an annual, annual contribution well in excess of $5 billion to the province. People have long warned us about relying too much on international education. Remember not to rely too much on the income that international students generate. It can disappear. Remember SARS, remember H1N1, or the currency crisis. Remember mad cow disease, Ebola, MERS. Remember not to put all of your eggs in one basket, but diversify. Remember that nothing lasts forever, and as George Harrison reminded us, all things must pass. Well, this pandemic has certainly captured our attention, and I think it is safe to say that we are all listening now. So I would like to begin by asking our panelists to provide a brief overview of their institution's experience navigating COVID-19 and any best practices learned while developing their responses to the pandemic. AJ, can we begin with you, please? Sure. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Randall. Um, first of all, I think just probably on behalf of all of us in public post-secondary, you probably need to acknowledge and thank uh, the students, the staff, and the faculty who've uh, done an amazing job of uh, undertaking what is probably a social experiment that couldn't have happened without the pandemic. And there's certainly a lot to learn, and we continue to learn uh, almost on a daily and some uh, basis of what things work well, what don't, and challenging the norms of public post-secondary and delivery of education in the post-secondary environment. So, so we're monitoring a lot of that carefully and, and seeing uh, what we may take out of COVID uh, that would help us be more resilient institutions moving into the future, uh, as well as looking at how the international uh, education component of it looks like. So I, I think I want to acknowledge the credit and credit all the students and the faculty. Um, what we've learned here at uh, VCC about uh, our entire community, um, that student, faculty and staff, is there's a bit of a can-do attitude here with a student-centered focus. Uh, the abrupt shift uh, that we had to make obviously required technology and the adoption of technology in many cases. In some cases, it presented a significant challenge, particularly as it related to experiential learning. In other cases, it presented an opportunity to do things differently, increase capacity, as well as reach out to uh, support students in a different way. And, and many students have adopted to that. Again, it hasn't come without its challenges. And then I think the third piece we've really learned out of this is the real value of what face-to-face -face learning is. And um, many of us probably know the soft skills agenda or, or something to that effect. And I think what we're being challenged during the pandemic is what are those soft skill pieces that have to be taught that are essential face-to-face -face and what can be done through technology. So for us, our strategy around international students has been a bit of a retention strategy for the summer. And I think that probably goes along with uh, what many others have done, um, and then the strategy around how we support those students uh, as they adjust to what was a remote learning or an alternate delivery with limited face-to-face. -face. Uh, we did f finish the semester, and starting this, this summer semester, we are doing some face-to-face, -face or will be doing some face-to-face, -face, and that'll be the essential face-to-face -to, -face to achieve uh, the key outcomes of some of the applied learning programs. Everything else will be from an alternate delivery mode, mostly online, using Zoom, or other types of those platforms. We've also uh, had a lot of uh, experience in learning about synchronous and asynchronous learning, which has uh, forced some of our faculty and staff uh, and even the support services to adjust uh, how they think about teaching and learning 
Um, I probably no different than many other institutions are Center for Teaching and Learning or, or Teaching and Learning Centers across the province and our IT departments have had to adopt quickly to help support students uh, and from a student perspective really getting an understanding of particularly international students where their gaps were some of them might be working off their iPhones others had laptops so we needed to get a real understanding of where some of the gaps were and what we actually found through the student survey was the gap wasn't around having the technology or the tool, the gap was around navigating the shift to online, whatever learning uh, platform we were using and how to navigate that. So we were able to provide support for students in that. Um, and then some of the other pieces that are real, uh, some best practices in learning is our School of Instructional Education has stepped forward. Uh, we've had over 120 faculty from around the country take some of our online learning modules and then our own Center for Teaching and Learning uh, that supports our internal faculty has had over 300 faculty move through various sessions on, on how to conduct online teaching. Um, and then the final piece I just want to comment on is our virtual student support services. Uh, that is probably a credit to uh, our international uh, education department as well as our uh, student success departments where they've made a shift but continue to provide services to students um, in, a, in a virtual way and then uh, when needed face to face. Um, and I can talk about specifics a little bit later on, but uh, there's a lot of credit for them there. So thank you. Thank you, AJ. Uh, Phil, Umbrella Roads is uh, unique in Canada uh, and a leader in Canada in terms of offering blended online programming and degrees. How have you navigated this uh, this crisis? Well, I can tell you I was really pleased that I wasn't at UBC through this because uh, <laughs> way bigger and way more complex. Having said that, um, we did face we did face challenges at any one time we've got about 70 percent of our students uh, online most of our programming is what we call blended so students work online and then they come to campus for short-term residencies so you would think it would be relatively easier for us to make this transition and i imagine it was it hasn't seemed that way because it's still required a huge amount of work we've had to move of course all our residencies online and residencies are very challenging to move online because typically they're two-week on-campus uh, intensive experiences where the students are engaged together and with faculty for 10, 12 hours a day. So moving those online has been challenging, but we in fact have a, re a residency of 200 Masters of Leadership students online right now, and, and I joined them in a welcome session on Sunday. So it's just, you know, AJ was talking about this, it's it's the ability to sort of adapt very quickly and to work with each of our equivalents of our centers for, for teaching and learning. Ours is our center for teaching and educational technology. They did an amazing job and were able to move uh, the, the balance of our program uh, programming online in a matter of days. But we still having to do that on an iterative basis as different residencies come up. One of our particular challenges is our international students are mostly in on-campus face-to-face programs. So we've seen a significant disruption of that programming. And because we don't have a regular sem uh, semester system, we have pretty much continuous intakes uh, through the year. We saw in real time with our May and our June intakes what the impact of, of this was on our international students. And I know we'll probably get to this um, in, in later questions, but we've seen a significant number of deferrals. So the, the challenge for all of us is now to figure out how we turn those deferrals into acceptances in the fall and sort of what systems we put in place in order to make that, uh, to make that feasible. Um, and we are looking at some real challenges. I mean, there are issues around firewalls in China, for instance, uh, you know, around the, the, the way the internet is managed there. There are issues around access to broadband in some of our uh, other source countries as well. So, so, so we're taking a look at, at, at the range of that. But to your general question, I mean, how we've managed and the lessons learned, I would say anticipation has been absolutely key for us just anticipating what's coming because this thing moves so quickly for all of us considering kind of all viewpoints looking at the evidence getting the right people in place in your organization giving them the power to kind of move ahead and make decisions um, and constantly thinking about scenarios and we've um, we've enlisted the help of some of our faculty who have expertise in emergency disaster management, in complex systems thinking, in resilience and adaptation, in order to inform through scenario building 
to inform our planning as we move ahead. And the final thing I would say is through all of this, um, we have articulated a set of principles and the number one principle is the health and safety of our community. So of our students, faculty and staff. And you make that the central principle and you keep the focus on people throughout this and in particular on students, as AJ said, and, and that's the way you, you, you kind of navigate. But uh, this is not a typical crisis. This is ongoing. We're not in a recovery phase. We are in a response phase with some recovery elements, um, but we are gonna be in a response phase to this crisis, most likely for another 18 months to two years. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Philip. Uh, Michelle, at the, at the Justice Institute, you're an institution where face-to-face -face instruction is crucial in many of your programs, uh, where innovative approaches to hybrid instruction and physical distancing are now paramount. Uh, what's been your experience? Yeah, thank you, uh, Randall. And just in keeping with Philip's uh, guiding principle, I mean, that uh, is at the forefront uh, for the Institute. Keeping students, staff, faculty safe is paramount. So, you know, we pivoted to online instruction where we could. We've halted face-to-face -face instruction um, until it's uh, safe to uh, invite students back onto the campus with all of the safety measures that would be in place guided by advanced education, uh, the PHO and WorkSafe BC. It's certainly true that some areas in which we train are dependent on scenario training and the evaluation of competencies. So that's a little more harder and trickier to pivot to online. Um, you know, where we were able to uh, navigate uh, to online courses in the short term we've done that. Uh, Blackboard is our learning management system. Uh, so we've been able to implement Collaborate um, to support excellence in teaching and learning as one example of connecting students with instructors in a synchronous way. Uh, it doesn't uh, replace a, a real live scenario with professional actors, whether or not it's uh, running through scenarios with our police academy uh, recruits, our sheriff academy, our paramedics, our firefighters, etc. Um, you know, certainly Skype for Business has been our main virtual meeting tool for all remote planning and recovery and looking at how we're going to reopen. I mean, as Canada's leading public safety educator, we intend to demonstrate leadership in the sector as we safely uh, invite uh, students and staff back on campus in a very measured way. I would say that even though we train in areas that are inherently uh, at risk, uh, we will continue to reduce the number of students in the classroom, that social distancing can be maintained, and also minimize the footprint of students as they flow through the campuses where physical proximity is necessary, but also following protocols to maximize uh, safety for all. Um, I'd say it's certainly important for us to continue our training uh, of those that are needed in the field to assist with public safety and including any opportunities or future outbreaks of uh, this virus or any other pandemic. My, I guess, final comment would be, um, you know, within some of our applied programs, we've moved as much as the theoretical and didactic content can be online. And we're looking at scheduling components through uh, the summer uh, to support the face-to-face uh, -face tactical training that police recruits, sheriffs, and uh, paramedics and firefighters require. So again, this will reduce the amount of time required in face-to-face -face environments here on any of our campuses as we begin to uh, you know, bring essential programs back into the building. Great, thank you. Uh, Philip, I appreciated your comment that we're still in the middle of a response and uh, not anticipating the recovery uh, in, a, in a full-blown way anytime soon. Now, you've all addressed uh, to some degree um, you're transitioning to uh, uh, to more hybrid, more uh, more online uh, learning. I'm wondering, is there other support or other goals to yet to achieve in terms of transitioning further content, further programming online, uh, and what kind of support might you need to do that, or do you have enough internally, for example? Uh, maybe we can uh, go around and maybe start with you, AJ. Sure. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I think, first of all, uh, th this is going to be a new norm for the next little while, so we probably, for many of our programs, it's probably some sort of a, a fully online or hybrid model, and I think what we have to do in terms of the disruption that this pandemic has caused us is to start supporting faculty uh, about what it could take about teaching online versus just moving to online, and there's a big difference there. I think we the abrupt shift had to be moved to online and, and try and see what we can do. Now it's about trying to support faculty about how to teach online, uh, how the pedagogy changes, and how they may have some different ways of dealing with things. And uh, so this is where I think technology really 
steps forward. Uh, we, we've we had uh, departments starting looking at VR, AR technology. Um, we've had a bit of a black box approach to, to teaching and learning. So, so students would use what's in their environment to, to create projects or to have discussions. Um, using student reflective field feedback, peer evaluations, many of the things that probably Royal Roads already does. Um, I, I can't emphasize enough the synchronous versus asynchronous learning opportunities. Uh, so I think uh, those are the types of things we're gonna have to look to support faculty. The second is supporting the students. Uh, and, and that really is about making sure that, first of all, the students have the tools necessary, particularly international students. So any of the new international students that may not be in country, or even if they are in country, making sure that they have the tools necessary. Um, so what, what is the platform um, in terms of a laptop they need? Uh, what is the you know the, the bandwidth that they need? All that type of stuff to make sure that they have the right tool. And then secondly, is help them navigate the software. So I think we're trying to look to provide sh and shift our services that way. Uh, we've got lab uh, laptop loan programs for students that can afford laptops, those types of things. Um, and then finally, adjusting orientation and helping students learn online. So um, for international students, we're probably all used to having them all come together and doing an orientation. I think in a virtual platform, it allows us to do general orientations as well as specific orientations. And because it's done in a, in a way that's uh, using technology, there's ways of having recordings made, there's ways of having resources readily available. So I think we're going to have to look at how can we customize things without making it onerous on the support services side. Uh, and then uh, looking at virtual student support services, and I think we'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, the our Bachelors of Emergency and Security Management degree program, it's been completely online since its inception. And so have our graduate programs in the area of intelligence analysis. Uh, whether that's business intelligence, criminal intelligence, and uh, cyber intel, which is currently under development online. Uh, the JBC, we've been a leader in the area of online learning for a number of years. We participate in many provincial in initiatives related to open access and certainly feel prepared to continue this work in areas that we've not previously thought about, such as our bachelor's in law enforcement is uh, pivoting to online for the fall of 2020. Uh, some of our programming as it relates to conflict resolution, mediation, dispute resolution uh, is pivoting to be online uh, and we're now considering how much of that we have capacity to do and of course because of the applied nature some of that we're still trying to figure out how to do that best and if we're going to have people on campus. Certainly our applied uh, tactical training programs are challenged to pivot completely online as I've mentioned before and uh, so we're looking at how do we do that in a safe way uh, over the next month or two. Um, I would say that our programming in the Center for Conflict Resolution, uh, Mediation, Negotiation and Leadership, as well as the Center for Counseling and Community Safety are uh, transitioning some of those courses uh, using Blackboard and Collaborate. However, you know, as we transition to online and blended instruction across all programming, it's really stretching our capacity in our Center for Teaching, Learning and Innovation. But our staff are rising to the challenge and the results have been really fantastic and amazing. I'd say over the past number of years, online learning at JVC has grown about 30% of all classes, so uh, it's not new to us. However, JVC does not have the capacity in our Center for Teaching and Learning to convert all of our programming to online. I'd say uh, that CTLI is leveraging our, our experience and expertise in developing effective distributed learning. Uh, certainly to support schools in the transition, as well as drawing on relationships with other PSIs and the BC campus to identify and implement resources and best practices across our sector. Uh, JABC is leveraging existing faculty and program staff as resources for the transition in providing options, templates, resources, skill development sessions, coaching and technical support. And I guess one of our strategies has been to develop hybrid approaches that mix online synchronous activities with traditional online approaches. And of course, that would reduce the need for extensive content and media development uh, in traditional online courses and also providing a mechanism to keep learners and faculty engaged with each other. Okay, great, thanks. Philip, I'll, I, you sort of answered this question before, but I might add the, the, the idea of sort of additional virtual student services. You know, you, you've got experience on the student service, student support side with, um, uh, with a lot of off-campus students. Have you had to sort of beef up that game as well? 
Yeah, and I think AJ and Michelle have covered the territory quite well. So obviously significant investments in your Center for Teaching and Educational Technology in our case, we've seen that across the country. Uh, you know, Western uh, University in Ontario announced putting 100 students in to support that particular enterprise. You've seen similar increased investments in student services, as, as you mentioned, and I've noticed that we have to move to a very high touch approach with students here. We are communicating directly with all of our students. After this call, in fact, I'm going out to campus to film uh, a, a, number of, uh, a number of short videos targeted at particular student audiences as well. Um, and our student services folks have noticed a huge increase in volume. So we've had to do a lot of redeployment within the organization. Obviously, some functions are down in activities and some are up. So we've moved people into the Center for Teaching and Educational Technology. We've moved people into the student services area. We've moved people into admissions and, and registration there because, you know, uh, as I mentioned, there's, there's a real need for high touch right now. I think we've all probably also invest a little more, focus a little more on, on mental health uh, resources as well and, and providing those, um, those resources not only to students but to faculty and staff. And I think we're gonna have to do that on a continuing basis as well. And then uh, at Rural Roads, what we're also looking at and where we are spending some time and energy is an investment in really trying to uh, break down our programming because I think coming out of this people are going to be looking for sort of bite-sized um, opportunities to come back into into post-secondary so we're looking at sort of breaking down our programming so people can come in do a few courses get some credits come back later maybe get a certificate bridge to a diploma and then eventually bridge to a degree or or a master's degree um, so that's another area where we are investing time, which is in program development. So not only in moving programs online, but also in looking at the very nature and the structure of programs and what we anticipate will be needed coming through this. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Now, this question for all of you, um, what are you doing in terms of uh, preparation for the fall. I know nobody can make predictions about what uh, September will look like in terms of domestic enrollment, in terms of international enrollment, but at this point in terms of your scenario planning, what are you looking at in terms of preparing classrooms for possible face-to-face -face and in terms of possible numbers of international students? Uh, AJ? Um, yeah, so we, we're like probably everybody else, we're doing a lot of scenario planning. I think what we are probably right now planning on the international student front is, um, first of all, some students are asking to defer and, and we're trying to accommodate that as best as possible, while also being very upfront with the students about the programs that have that experiential learning piece. We work with our program areas to see where we can front load the theory and back end the practicum in under the assumption that the students should be able to at least start coming back to the country in January and have a plan in place if they, if they cannot. <laughs> The scenario modeling, I, I think many of us done it. Uh, we've been kind of working with numbers of 25, and this is with new students, 25%, 50%, 70% might be a bit of a stretch just knowing what the realities are. Uh, but I think the key consideration here is what's the what's the short-term effect versus where's the, the long-term piece? And that's something I think we all have to keep in mind um, that we know international education uh, can grow quickly, but it, it can uh, fall even quicker if we don't manage our reputation piece. So we have to kind of keep that in mind. So we're, we're looking at the 18 to 20 more, 24 month outlook on the international student front. Um, last week, we know that post-grad work permit policy was extended into the fall semester, but the next challenge is gonna be, are they gonna get study permits and what's that going to look like? And if they can't get into the country in January, how are we gonna accommodate those students? These are all reputational pieces that I think we all have to think through and consider and play into our scenario modeling. We know SDS is not a priority right now either. Um, so everything's regular visa processing. And we know uh, other jurisdictions that have been hit by uh, the COVID crisis uh, are paralyzed in terms of processing visas and it was slow to begin with. So what effect is that? Um, currency devaluation and the economy. So we're looking at that in some of our market countries where you know, what's the currency effect going to be and should we be encouraging students to actually stay in their home country even if they can get themselves to Canada um, and then finally I think we want to uh, we want to see look see the opportunities in emerging markets and 
uh, in some ways, technology has become an equalizer in this COVID crisis. And so how do we use that from a digital marketing perspective, education delivery, student orientation? Um, so I, th I think the advice I'd have for most people, it's uh, keep, keep the long game in mind and know that it's gonna be competitive coming out of COVID. Uh, but Canada, and, and I'll suggest British Columbia uh, more so, is well positioned to take advantage of that if we do this in a bit of a strategic and uh, measured way. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, thank you. Um, certainly our senior team has been engaged in foresight planning uh, once we were able to support employees working from home, and that took about seven to 10 days, which was uh, remarkable to many of us that that, that actually worked. Uh, but particularly our deans and our directors around scenario modeling that AJ has already referenced uh, for each of our three schools and the impact on the Institute as a whole. Uh, certainly providing risk assessments, uh, setting up classrooms for social distancing, modeling on campuses, and where face-to-face -face training includes no social distancing uh, provisions. Um, again, I've mentioned this before, but you know our police academy recruits, our sheriff recruits, use of force training, firearms, et cetera. I mean, that's really hard to do in a virtual space. And so we're looking at how can we best do that in a safe way uh, in, in the short term as we look at the fall planning. Um, at this time, our planning is, again, to support programs that are required to have face-to-face -face instruction on campus and employees who are required to be on campus in support of those programs primarily for the months of June, July, and August. And more planning continues uh, this month and into June for the fall semester. Our restart plan will take the following approach, and that's courses will continue to be conducted online wherever possible. And for programs that require face-to-face -face instruction and evaluation, all theory instruction will be online where possible to minimize the amount of time as students are on campus and reducing the contact intensity. Certainly uh, our education leaders are working closely with our facilities teams, occupational health and safety, ensure any in-person delivery uh, of programming is uh, you know, in keeping with guidelines presented by the ministry, the PHO and uh, WorkSafe guidelines. So I'll just end here. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. And Philip? Yeah, um, I mean, as I mentioned before, we had intakes of international students coming into master's programs in May and June. So we've seen the the immediate impact of this and, and those numbers were way, way down, uh, largely deferrals. Um, but yet for the fall uh, at Royal Roads and at the other research universities, I know we've seen record applications for the fall. But uh, that doesn't encourage me. That just makes me incredibly nervous because I don't know how those are going to translate. And when you're trying to put together a budget, it's very, very challenging to make, um, you know, a good guess about about what the poll is going to look like and how that's going to translate. So a number of the tactics uh, AJ spoke about are absolutely critical. I mean, we've been working, we've been working with the federal government, of course, to advocate for advocate for significant flexibility around, for instance, recognition of online learning in a student's home country. We've been working with particular uh, high commissions in key countries as well to see whether we can expedite uh, visa processing. Uh, we've been exploring the notion of whether there, there would be some kind of interest in uh, allowing for flights of international students and you know when those might occur. Um, we've, we've taken advantage of digital marketing to kind of look at some some new markets as well, just so we diversify in our risk. But I, I would say this is all characterized by a very, very high degree of uncertainty. And we've seen now pr practically every institution finally admit that the fall is going to be primarily online, although all of us are trying to carve out a little bit of room for on-campus, in-person, where it's needed. Uh, and some institutions, of course, have some programming, as Michelle's mentioned, where it's absolutely critical. And on that front, I mean, we've done a inventory of our space on campus. We've measured all our spaces and we've uh, modeled social uh, physical distancing. And the truth is, it's really tough. I mean, we we down to about 25 percent usage. And because we have a number of small classrooms, given our model, um, some of those rooms are actually completely ineffective. Uh, so we're looking at our space generally around campus to see whether we can't repurpose bigger space. Um, but I think from, for us, in any case, this is more thinking about January 2021 than it is thinking about the fall. I think for us, we are pretty much going to be online in the fall with all of our programming. And we're all just going to have to work as hard as hell uh, to 
to provide to provide the assurances to international students that if they begin their studies online, um, that you know that effort will be recognized and that there will be a place for them, you know, if not in the fall, then certainly in the new year. But if you look at a number of scenarios, we might be into this in the new year as well. So I agree again with AJ that you know this is an 18-month kind of two-year proposition, and we have to have that kind of time horizon in mind as we do our planning. Um, thank you. Uh, it's interesting you say that you got and you and your colleagues <coughs> in the research universities have a record number of applications. I think in some way that might be because of the way the BC system is structured, where the K to twelve system, the colleges, uh, they're they're sort of feeding at the end to the end of the funnel at the at the research universities. It'd be interesting to notice to note the in the K to twelve system or the uh, or the private colleges and things uh, what what their numbers are looking like in terms of new applications. Uh, you referenced uh, digital marketing, and uh, a couple of you did. Um, are you are your institutions having success in um, in in moving um, your recruitment model to uh, to maybe more of a boutique model, uh, more directly related to agents uh, using virtual activities and things like that? Uh, maybe Philip, I can start with you right away. Yeah, we're looking at all kinds of different uh, modes right now. So some direct in marketing, digital marketing. Um, we are we have reached out to different agents in in the last couple of months to people kind of on the ground with a lot of on the ground experience um you know we did have a relationship at royal roads university with study group but that relationship was coming to an end now um so i think our our model moving forward is going to be far more customized to each particular market and given that there have been different experiences of the COVID emergency in different markets and different government responses um, I, I, you know, I think I think we have to customize and we have to adapt it. But there is an opportunity. I mean, the equalizer here, of course, is there is an opportunity now that most of us have to be online for a while to kind of reach into uh, into markets that we haven't tr traditionally been that active in. I mean, prior to this, we all we were all talking about the business risk about huge dependence for our incremental revenues on international students, and in particular. Our, our dependence on on certain markets like China and India. Now, this has been a huge wake-up call, I think, certainly for us, that uh, you know diversification is 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 here in force. And uh, while we will remain strongly committed to those traditional markets, we also, I think, now have additional encouragement uh, to diversify and look at customized approaches uh, in in those particular markets. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, from our perspective, we're sustaining activity both uh, in both regions, uh, and I mean China and India, as we're pursuing new partnerships uh, to stabilize our work uh, in both countries. But we're also looking at other markets, including Central and South America. Uh, that was part of our international strategy prior to COVID. And so we're participating in a number of virtual fairs, an increased focus on networking and marketing with agents as well as organizations and institutions in both of those regions. I think the diversification of our international student population has always been a priority for us and key to our sustainable growth. Uh, we have uh, we suspected international student mobility will resume faster in mature markets such as China and India, considering the safe perception of having a larger community and perhaps even relatives living in Canada. Uh, although we have to continue, continue to uh, seek a diverse student body, from different uh, regions and reasons that go from uh, for improved uh, learning experiences uh, to uh, looking at risk management. I'd say that uh, since it's uncertain how fast the different countries will recover from this pandemic, that we have adapted and are facilitating uh, some of our admissions processes uh, to the new reality, uh, removing possible roadblocks, and that includes you know pay my tuition online banking, Duolingo uh, online English pathway partnerships and also working uh, on the entrance award uh, for students coming from selected developing markets. Okay, thanks. And briefly, AJ? Um, uh, just to add a few more things for us at BCC specifically, the technology has allowed us to actually address some of the capacity issues where there is program demand for international students. So I think uh, that's a positive coming out of this for us. 
uh, to Philip's comment and Michelle as well, market specific targeting I think is really important here. Um, I've noted here that is this the market correction that we were looking for in international education in British Columbia and then how do we come, come out of that? So I think we have a huge opportunity to do a lot of niche marketing. Uh, many of us as institutions have some different niche programs. There's obviously duplication and overlap, but we also have our unique boutique uh, approaches to things. Uh, technology allows us to market ourselves in a whole different way. And so I think if we can take our approach of using the Canada brand, the BC brand as a way of getting into jurisdictions uh, and then use our niche marketing abilities uh, in terms of our uh, institutions, we might have a, a whole different way of uh, recruiting students and uh, going into an environment that's probably going to be much more competitive as we come out of COVID. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, to reference uh, something uh, uh, Philip, uh, Philip mentioned, um, there's a wonderful quote I read a few weeks back uh, from an Italian novel written in the 1950s called The Leopard about the Italian takeover of Sicily. As if we want things to stay as they are, things will have to change. And I really think that's sort of where the direction we're going with the sector. Things will have to change if we want to get back to what we thought was normal. And we've been given a golden opportunity here to pursue instant diversity, which we've been talking about for years. The over-reliance, again, 30 years ago on Japan, for the last 15 years on China, increasingly from India, this over-reliance on, uh, on one or two key markets. And I'm just wondering, um, if you have new key markets you've identified, the survey we did a few about six weeks ago, which seems an eternity ago, um, indicated strong interest in pursuing new markets in Latin America, especially refocusing on Mexico, uh, Colombia, uh, Brazil, um, Chile, uh, increasingly in Southeast Asia, uh, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand. Uh, Central Europe, uh, uh, Eastern Europe, the Ukraine, Russia, number of markets like that. To see uh, the all of the sectors seem to be very interested in 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 moving into in a more aggressive fashion. Uh, any sense from you folks? Maybe Michelle, I'll begin with you about uh, about where the JI might go on that. Yeah, and I think I might have touched on this in my last uh, response, but certainly looking at Central America, uh, certainly uh, and South America are markets that would be new to JBC. Um, as far as uh, China, um, you know, we've had a long relationship with Tier 1 police colleges. Police education in China is a four-year baccalaureate, and we've been offering uh, one semester study abroad that uh, students can apply to their baccalaureate back home. Obviously, that's dried up for us at this time. Uh, for the last 26 years, uh, we've been in Hong Kong providing paramedic training using the curriculum that we have here at the Institute. And uh, approximately, you know, actually it's 30 years coming up to 30 years in Hong Kong and 26 years in Singapore, where we're providing uh, paramedic training to the Singapore Armed Forces. In the last 10 years, Singapore, uh, the public ambulance service. So those markets are stable for us. Uh, it's, you know, following the train, the trainer model. Um, you know, we're looking at opportunities uh, where we have been in the past in the Middle East, where it's safe to be uh, and providing Global Affairs Canada as positive working relationships with those governments. You know, we'll continue to pursue that, but it's definitely uh, more of a laser sharp focus on uh, South America and Central America for the Institute. Great. Hi, AJ? Um, I, I, I think we'll be in the traditional markets of India and China, but I think uh, the pursuit there might be more around sustainability and looking at not just in recruitment, but possibly partnership models or, or how we can evolve those relationships. I, I put Vietnam and uh, Brazil in that uh, category for us as well. I think we definitely have to look at new markets. Uh, so many of the ones that you've already mentioned, uh, Randall, and, and we'd really like to see where the programming that we offer lines up with some of those markets and, and look for those opportunities. So I, I think we're certainly on board with that. I think what, where we have to probably really look at is from a sector perspective um, where the opportunities are and, and what those return on investments are. We know part of it's driven by the finances um, and we know some of these countries can be sensitive to that so I think there's going to be some market research then. The one thing I think uh, if many many of us on the call here or in the webinar probably know that all the research from ISAF, IDP, number of other areas show that there's a strong interest in Canada still as a result of COVID uh, in India, in China, in Vietnam, in Brazil. So we know our strength and our reputation is there. We're in the top two or three, in some cases, still number one, even though uh, study permit issuances are down. 
Um, I think we've got to continue to facilitate that, but where is it that we can go from number five to number two? Uh, the African market is another one we need to look at. So I think we've got an opportunity here to reset, to rethink things through uh, in a way, and also, again, alignment of what programs or institutions offer with the jurisdictions, and that might give us the diversity we want as a province and within our institutions. Great, thank you, Philip. Yeah, um, well, of those countries you mentioned, uh, Randall, I would say, you know, we, we have traditional strength, obviously, in China and India, and, and like AJ, we're looking at what sustainability looks like there and what kind of partnerships we, we want there, um, and we were doing this, obviously, prior to COVID, uh, but but in, in Asia, Vietnam, of course, and the Philippines would be areas of focus for us, uh, Mexico and Colombia. And then we've targeted four African countries, too, where we've been active in, in the last while as well. And we are looking at, as well, um, enhancing relationships in Europe, actually, in, in Northern Europe, for, for the most part, where we've had historic relationships like the business school in, in Grenoble, and we've got partnerships in, in Germany and in Holland as well. So, so we'll, we'll be taking a look at all of that. But I think we have to put a new lens on this because the the world is not going to return to the the previous normal after this. It is going to be different, and these countries have been affected in different ways. So I think uh, to assume we can just go back to our old strategies is mistaken. I mean, maybe elements of those old strategies, but we have to put put the lens of this COVID of this COVID emergency and our recovery from it on all of that. And I think we are in a very strong position in Canada, as AJ mentioned. I mean, you look at all the recent surveys, we're still ranking very highly. And in particular, because we've managed the pandemic so well as a country, but as a jurisdiction, British Columbia has managed it better than any other. And uh, we know that safety is a big, big issue for students and their families, international students and their families. So I think we should be really strongly marketing, uh, marketing that. And the other thing is, we haven't had the same kind of, there have unfortunately been some incidents of, of racist attacks, particularly on people of Asian descent as a result of this, um, but we haven't had the extent of it that other countries have. And certainly at our government level, there's been a very, very uh, strong, uh, strong support for all of the community and a strong commitment to, to multiculturalism here. And I think we, we can build on that for sure as we go out into these new markets. Thanks. Thanks very much. Now, uh, one thing we haven't looked on, uh, looked at yet is sort of outbound student mobility, the study abroad experience, which um, our friends in ISEP, one of the largest international providers globally, they, they've spent all their reserve evacuating and returning students. UMAP, I mean, all of these major, major providers of international study abroad our institutions with their own study abroad programs, they're all gutted. No students, of, no, none of our students are going to be moving out this fall, debatable whether it be going anywhere in, in January, if we can establish our own sort of travel corridors or travel bubbles. Uh, I understand from what I'm reading recently, there remains a uh, an interest in virtual internships for our students, international internships done, done online, done virtually. I'm just wondering uh, your experience, your thinking about study abroad, and again, hard to tell what the future will look like, but uh, um, any sense of, uh, of how that is going to be affected for BC and, uh, and Canada? Uh, AJ? Um, yeah, uh, so you've already mentioned travel will be limited and even if travel is allowed there will be restrictions in place and so safety and security is going to have to be at the first uh, front and foremost uh, for students to even start engaging. Um, I think um, from a VCC perspective, we have limited study abroad to begin with, and we're really hoping uh, this federal government investment coming out uh, that was announced uh, about a year and a half ago, the UMAP opportunities, what CI Can was doing, those might provide opportunities to get more of our students abroad. Obviously, that's probably going to look different or be paused to a certain extent. So I do think we're going to have to look at virtual uh, opportunities, uh, also taking advantage of students that might be learning in the home country and then coming to us, there may create some different opportunities. Uh, so I think we have to be open to all those possibilities. I think we probably here would look to the research universities first because that is one element of it that might uh, start up more quickly than, than other elements of it in terms of that travel. Um, and then look for our traditional partners we might have had with other schools or at a departmental level and see 
what element of, of safety and security and comfort there is in terms of having those student exchanges or field schools, um, smaller in number. But uh, I think this is going to be slow startup uh, happening. Um, and like I said, I think we'd look to the teaching use uh, uh, to see what they're doing. Oh, sorry, the research universities to see what they're doing uh, to kind of follow suit and use some of the best practices from there. Great. Thank you, Jim. And Michelle, I'm not sure if the JI is really deeply involved in sending its students abroad. Yeah, we have just a small percentage of students in our undergraduate programs, primarily in Europe. So that would be um, uh, um, Ireland, uh, the UK, uh, primarily, where uh, students either in their third year of their baccalaureate programs, are, but the numbers are quite low in, in that regard. But I guess, you know, when I think about um, opportunities to work with clients and around customized training tailored to their needs, um, the work that uh, I've already mentioned, you know, really relates to our international work in Hong Kong as well as Singapore uh, primarily. But again, it's a different model in the sense of training the trainer. Yeah. And Philip? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think we just have to admit this has been a huge setback. I mean, out, out by mobility and numbers were very low for Canadian students before this. We got that fantastic federal investment. We were all very excited. We've been designing programs. There was going to be a ton of flexibility for all of us. And then this came along and this has set us back and it will set us back years, I'm afraid. Uh, and we just need to be realistic about that and think about, you know, what the alternatives are. And hopefully we can redirect some of that investment into the kinds of things AJ was talking about, uh, you know, virtual in internships, I think, are a way to go. And then when we start slowly, uh, you know, going back to travel and international travel, I think some, some little pilots, and perhaps they are going to be based initially around kind of research collaborations and things like that. We could maybe look at small cohort models as well with partner institutions where, you know, we were very confident about the the health and safety guidelines in place in, in a receiving institution and we could reciprocate here. Uh, but we're gonna have to get our toes, you know, our toes back in, in the water on this and and just uh, see see how it emerges. Um, and the truth of this is, and we all gonna face this at our institutions, even when we think it's safe to come back and do things in so-called normal way, there will be staff and faculty and students who don't necessarily agree with us. So, you know, those are interesting issues that we're going to have to navigate. And people's levels of anxiety and comfort are going to uh, currently vary dramatically and will continue to vary. And some will be comfortable sooner, sooner, sooner than others. So I think this is going to be a kind of evolutionary process. Um, but aside from the idea of, of some virtual uh, immersions, say virtual internships and that, uh, you know, I don't see much opportunity for the next while and, until we've kind of got travel going again. Yeah. No, I agree that uh, reputationally, uh, British Columbia has done very well and should be a desirable destination. But as you suggest, even if students are prepared to get on airplanes, either our students going out or international students coming in, their parents might not be so keen about it. And so there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of stakeholders uh, in, involved in this. Um, one question that's coming out online, specifically uh, interested to hear from AJ, what parameters are being put in place at BCC to ensure appropriate distancing, specifically in a medical lab setting where full PPEs are being used? Um, that's funny, we were going through that uh, recently. So uh, I, health uh, programs across all of our public post-secondaries are under this challenge. Uh, <clears throat> so PHO has provided guidelines, obviously, around social distancing and uh, uh, measures in terms of gathering spaces. So as it relates to on-campus health lab activities, obviously those would be followed in terms of social distancing measures and appropriate PPE when it's just student and instructor environment. And obviously if the students are working intimately closer to each other, there'll be more PPE equipment required. If they're able to socially distance, uh, they'll have to have, you know keep themselves six feet apart, uh, be able to wear a mask uh, and provide uh, some of that virtual learning. Once they get into practicum settings, that is really under the jurisdiction of the health authorities, depending on where they are. Um, we know some of the outbreaks that have happened in the healthcare facilities, uh, and then obviously the hospitals, whether they're in a COVID environment or non-COVID environment. So we really take a lot of guidance from not only the PHO, but also the health authorities, and, and the health authorities have various uh, 
uh, mechanisms in, in which they have some standards uh, established depending on what ward you're doing placements on. So it is very specific, uh, but for us here specifically at the institutions, it's I think Philip alluded to it and so did Michelle, we are following the PHO guidelines, WorkSafe BC guidelines, um, and I think as many of us probably experience, it'll be ever evolving as we get back to limited and essential face-to-face, -face, uh, similar to uh, when COVID first hit and we had to go to supermarkets. And now when you go to supermarkets, it's very different in terms of the flow of traffic, how many people are allowed in there. So I think we'll be looking at all of those types of things. Uh, health better than anybody in my mind, though, is probably the best to help us navigate this forward. Uh, so I think we should all keep that in mind because they are an essential service and this is their profession. Okay. Thanks very much. Well, now, one final question. We're uh, rapidly running out of time here. Uh, we've received several comments in the survey and, uh, and anecdotally about the, the desire or need for broader systemic coordination uh, and direction from government, from our education ministries, uh, from us as your crown agency with, with a mandate to support kindergarten to PhD, public, private. Um, but we're all also aware that the public post-secondary system carefully guards its autonomy. Can you suggest one or two key items uh, for which your institution would prioritize in terms of needing support or coordination for the entire system? Maybe Philip, I can begin with you. Oh, damn, I was hoping you'd ask somebody else that one. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think you you know there's that saying, never waste a good crisis, and the, the, there certainly were issues that we needed to address as a system prior to this, and now I think they exacerbated. A lot of institutions are going to come under significant financial stress. We are. I'm sure others are as well. Uh, it's not only the loss of international student revenue, but a lot of us have lost ancillary revenues, summer program revenue, all of that kind of stuff. And so I think there is an opportunity, but there needs to be some leadership on this. There is an opportunity to look system-wide at uh, you know, how we could could collaborate more closely. I think there's a great opportunity to look at, for instance, at duplication across programming to really have an honest discussion about what we really do well and 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 what we should focus on. So I would, I, you know, the, the the one recommendation I would have out of this is a kind of convening, and this would have to be done in a way that everybody felt safe in the space because we're all feeling a little under pressure uh, right now but a convening where we could really focus on what are our strengths and how can we build on those strengths and how can we increase collaboration across the system to support each other on this. And one area might be, uh, for instance, when we're looking externally, really to get serious about a joint marketing effort as well. I mean, we, we have a national one, but a provincial one, all of the institutions could benefit rather than us all running off and trying to do our own thing. I mean, we will do our own customized approaches, I understand that. But in terms of marketing, the province marketing um, this this particular uh, e experience, um, I, I I would strongly strongly argue, argue for argue for that. Great, thank you. Music to my ears, um, uh, Michelle. Yeah, two things. Uh, the first area, in addition to what uh, Philip has already identified, would be looking at increased support coordination across the system as it relates to support for online. Uh, uh, instruction, so whether or not that's web designers, instructional designers, I mean, we're all feeling stretched. Some institutions have more capacity than others given their size. But if there's a way to support or have more investment, uh, knowing that we're going to need to uh, push in that direction in the fall and in the subsequent years. And I, just to pick up on Philip's uh, last comment there, you know, when I think about a shared or common curriculum to support student mobility, you know, should all institutions be rushing to get their first year English or psychology or whatever it is online? And, uh, you know, is there a way to find a common sort of a place for some of that programming and allow some of us who are more specialized to really focus on our specialty courses and uh, look at ways to support a system-wide sort of approach. So um, I would just echo the uh, same uh, sentiments that Philip just shared about that. Thanks, Michelle. And last word to AJ. Um, so adding just to the, I think we really do need to rethink public post-secondary and the, po and the whole education system. So this COVID gives us that chance. Uh, I think we've been. This has been a common theme throughout the whole webinar. Let's keep the long game in mind. Let's keep our reputation in mind. We've done a great job in British Columbia. We were a preferred destination for education. 
let's combine the two and, and we should be talking about that right now how well we've done COVID how well we've supported the international students that were here uh, I've had consul generals phone me unsolicited saying how happy they have been with the support we provided to the students we need to leverage that as a BC brand and a BC education system as well the reality is the privates are struggling through this COVID or some of them probably are is there an opportunity for that better collaboration between privates and publics uh, uh, and I know people have strong opinions on that. And then I can't emphasize enough, this is the opportunity to market correct on the diversity side of things. Uh, and whether that's through collaboration um, or, or some other way, I think we've got to take the opportunity and advantage of doing that. Otherwise, we may never get it again. Um, and then to, to do that through BCCA, I think would be the best way to do it because you cover all of the sectors. You can do the broader marketing piece, and as Philip mentioned, it allows us to come in and have that niche or differentiation strategies, institutions, where we can actually support one another rather than uh, try and compete with one another. Great. Thank you, AJ. Thank you all very, very much. Much appreciated. We have hit our, our one-hour time limit. It went by so quickly. Uh, that's all the time we have. I'd like to thank all three of you for joining us today and taking part in the virtual forum. Uh, we will uh, try to address some of the questions that have come in online and uh, a recording of today's event will be sent out to all registrants and uh, uh, you can watch it two or three times today again. <laughs> so thank you all very much. Thanks for everybody uh, 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 online who joined us this morning. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Thanks. you.